What's up, everybody? Welcome back to class. This will be kind of like my final lecture for the year. Uh, and again, if you didn't watch the instructional video for how you can get some extra credit, uh, I'd go back and watch that one first. So uh, know that this uh, lecture is not required. It's a bonus lecture where I'm giving a lot of behind the scenes and like supplemental info to the movie Cinderella Man. I think I've mentioned this more than once, but I absolutely love the Jim Braddock story and I love the movie Cinderella Man. Um, now it came out, it's an older movie, about 20 years ago, uh, but I think it holds up really good because you don't need a lot of special effects and stuff for a boxing movie. Uh, so the way it was shot 20 years ago, I, I don't think it could be really done any better today. Uh, also, I think it's just a timeless story. It's a, it's a true story from history uh, that, man, it, it just, it captures my interest and tugs at my heartstrings and like uh, just kind of motivates me. And it's, I think overall a feel good story. Um, now I actually never saw it when it came out at the theater. Uh, it was when I was in college, I somehow totally missed it. It wasn't until like my second year of teaching US history that I was looking for some good movies and specifically one at that time that would tie into the Great Depression. And another teacher recommended it to me and I've used it every year in class since uh, and just love the story. And uh, also every year I've done more and more research on it. So here's where I'm kind of sharing with you a ton of my other supplemental research that I've done over the last decade plus. Uh, and this is stuff that I think is relevant to the story, uh, would interest you and hopefully you like it, all right? So let's start off with Jim Braddock. Uh, everybody knows him from the movie Cinderella Man. I think Russell Crowe was cast top not or like terrifically to play him. I mean, if you look at these photos that I have up here are both the real Jim Braddock from that era. I think Russell Crowe looks a lot like him. Honestly, I can't think of any other actors in Hollywood that I would pick over him uh, to play that role. Next up, Here's the Braddock family. Again, I feel like they were cast pretty darn accurate. Uh, you know, it is true that he had two sons, uh, Howard and Jay, or actually I got that backwards. Jay is the oldest, then Howard, uh, both in the photo there. You can kind of see their little mug shots. Rosie was the little daughter. Uh, his wife, May, I think, man, all of them were cast really good too. Uh, Renee Zellweger, who plays May Braddock, I thought she did a really good job, really kind of captures like the concern she had uh, for Braddock as he's going to fight this guy that had killed two men. Um, yeah, and all that stuff are really like true aspects of the story. So I say, usually a lot of Hollywood movies will change the story. They'll add in a, an extra love story or an affair or some drama or blah, 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 who knows what. But uh, one thing I like about this movie and Ron Howard, who is the director, uh, he stuck to the story. He changed a few minor things that I'll get into in a minute, but overall he stuck really darn close to what actually happened. And that's a good idea because the true story is a really interesting one. Uh, next up. So it said right at the end of the movie that uh, Braddock and his manager, Joe Gould, there's Joe, uh, both served honorably during World War II. So think about it. The Max Bear fight was in 1935. Uh, he holds the title for another year or two, really only does one more fight and ends up losing the title to, I'll get into this guy more in a minute, but Joe Lewis, the brown bomber from Detroit City, who ends up usually going down as the best heavyweight, uh, heavyweight boxer in like world history. All right, so if you're gonna lose it, might as well lose it to a top-notch dude. Uh, anyway, World War One or World War Two, my apologies, starts up in 1939. America gets involved right at the very end of the year in 1941. Uh, so that this would be happening about six, seven years after uh, he had won the title from Max Bear. Uh, Jim is older, like even at that point in his boxing career, he was up like, I think in his uh, second half of his thirties, by the time the war breaks out, he's up in his forties. Uh, Gould is every bit that old. I think he was like 45, maybe even getting close, later forties to 50 uh, at this time. So know that these guys actually, uh, they didn't go and like fight in the front lines or like see combat, but uh, they did, get they they served honorably uh through the war and typically like the young guys are the ones that are going to be out on the front lines doing the fighting and if you were an older guy and got pulled in well there's a whole lot of jobs in the military i'm not sure exactly what braddock and gould did uh but they were in other like support roles uh supporting those guys that were out on the front lines also because 
Braddock was at that time a former heavyweight champ, they used him in a lot of propaganda stuff and recruiting things and like, come on out, join the army, be tough like uh, like old Jim Braddock, who was the heavyweight champ. And, you know, his manager had g- gained quite a bit of fame too because of everything that had played out in the movie Cinderella Man. So both kind of nationally known figures, big sports star. Um, so didn't see combat, but served through the war. Very honorable guy. Uh, yeah, and did his part. All right, so Jim and Joe, here they are, some more close-ups. Again, I think both of them were cast pretty good. I really like the actor that plays Joe. Uh, these guys end up, for the most part, living a pretty long, happy, healthy life. They kind of get into Braddock's backstory uh, that, you know, two years later, he ends up losing the title to Joe Lewis. Uh, I'll get into, there was a clause in the contract, though, that paid off big time. Uh, but what I kind of want you to know from here after he won the heavyweight title, got his purses up, and then after the Joe Lewis fight, these guys aren't really hard up for cash the rest of their life. I'm not saying they're rich. They don't make as much money as a like top-tier champion boxer would today. Actually, not even close. Um, but they made enough money that they could live comfortably, and even though the depression's still going on, neither one of them had to worry about paying their electric bill or the heat bill. Uh, neither one of them had to worry about, you know, getting money to the milkman or putting food on the table. They were able to like stabilize their lives and live comfortably, uh, you know, for the rest of their lives. Jim actually used a lot of his money to buy a equipment. Uh, and he started like his own construction company. Uh, and then he was kind of like a boss man down on the docks uh, where he had worked and just done shift by shift, you know, day to day labor during the depression. Um, Gould, I think he continued to be a like boxing, uh, you know, manager and promoter. Um, I've never gotten the whole story to this. So maybe this is my project before next year. But Joe Gould actually got in trouble like embezzling some money. It had nothing to do with Jim, uh, but he had done some shady financial stuff. This is like after World War II and ends up going to prison for a year or two. But I've never quite got that whole story. So I don't know. That'd be something you could look into if, if it interested you. All right, next up. So I moved this one picture because I didn't want my face blocking it. But here are some photos from uh, some of the notable fights you saw in the movie and one you didn't see. So top corner here, that's Jim Braddock standing like with his back to you. This guy over here is Max Bear. Uh, you might notice one thing looks a little bit different and Max looks kind of wobbly like he's about to fall down. But just like it showed in the movie where uh, Max Bear was like touching his head and dancing around and doing the thing and saluting the crowd, Max Bear really did all that stuff. Uh, he really did think Jim Braddock was a chump and he was clowning around. I don't know if you caught the one announcer said, who's going to show up in the first round of the fight? Is it going to be the killer or the clown? Because sometimes Max Bear would come out there and just go fists of fury and blast people. Uh, other times he would take the first couple rounds of the fight and just screw off. And like he, I think he totally understood that a sport like boxing or today an MMA, a big part of it is like crowd appeal and selling tickets. And he did really good kind of being that like antagonist villain kind of cocky fighter uh, who's just running his mouth and everything. And he was really good at like getting the crowd into it. Now in the movie, it makes him look like a villain. Um, I'll say, I'll get into Max Bear a little more in a minute. I don't think he in real life was a villain. He's actually a decent guy, but I do think they portrayed him accurately that He's very cocky and arrogant and he, you know, would showboat and do things like that. And he's a good boxer. That's kind of a common thing in the sport. Now down here, uh, these two guys, this is the fight before the Max Bear title fight. That's that Art Lasky. Uh, that was a part of the movie where they combined two fights together and you saw him fighting uh, John Henry Lewis, who was a black guy that he had lost two years before. He wins a decision there. And then Art Lasky was the guy that broke Jim's ribs. So he was still kind of banged up going into the bear fight. Uh, but anyway, there, there's a photo of him. And then the two on this side are both uh, uh, Braddock fighting Joe Lewis. So this is like two years after, roughly two years after uh, the Max Bear fight where he won the title. Uh, Joe Lewis is, is going to be the new heavyweight champ because I guess he decisively beats Braddock. Uh, but some cool things about that fight, uh, Joe Lewis had been, he, he was kind of in a similar situation to uh, Jack Johnson, if you remember my lecture about him. And the racism of this time was totally different than the racism of today. Uh, Joe Lewis probably should have already been heavyweight champ. He was really good. He was a top-notch fighter, but he had a hard time locking in that title fight. So credit to Jim Braddock. He didn't have to fight Joe Lewis. He, I think him and Joe, they looked at it and they said, well, 
Joe Lewis is probably legitimately the best boxer out there in the country. He's the one that deserves to have the title fight. And they were able to work out a deal that they could both make quite a bit of money off this fight. And uh, Jim actually it was the first boxer ever to knock Joe Lewis down to the canvas. So even though... He basically has no chance at really winning this fight because Lewis is like, Lewis is definitely, he is heads and shoulders above Braddock, Max Bear, any of the guys you just saw in this movie. He usually goes down as, he's always ranked as the top a top three boxer in all history. And usually he gets named as the top boxer, heavyweight boxer anyway in world history. So he's a pretty phenomenal guy. Um, Anyway, uh, Lewis, he actually has a very different take from uh, from Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson, who was really cocky and arrogant and a showboater, uh, he, I don't think Joe Lewis wanted to take that much flack and that much heat in his personal life. So he was actually really kind of like more calm and collected and not a super arrogant, uh, cocky guy. But he did go on to say, even though uh, Braddock had knocked him down, Lewis goes on to basically win all the rest of the rounds of the fight. And afterwards, uh, Joe Lewis is now the new heavyweight champ. And he did say that uh, he thought, at, this is at the end of his career, that Jim Braddock was like the most courageous guy he ever fought. And he absolutely, I think they both had a real mutual respect for each other. Uh, so know that when Braddock does actually lose the title, it's not quite like the Max Bear fight, where it was a bunch of hype and like, you know what I mean, clowning around and trash talking. I think these guys actually did kind of mutually respect each other. And, and that was that. It was just kind of a good fight. And Lewis uh, ended up winning. All right, Max Bear. So I love Max Bear in this movie. I think he plays a great villain. Uh, <clears throat> they they hype that up quite a bit. Now in real life, I don't think you get this side to it in the movie. Um, real life, Max Bear, he had his stage persona and then he had his like who he was in real life. I think in real life, from what I've read about him, he was probably a little bit cocky, a little bit arrogant, like any really good pro athlete generally is. Uh, but I think he was a very decent person and a nice guy. Uh, I think, again, he was cast really good. I'm not sure who the actor was that played him, but man, I thought he did a real good job and actually looks like the real Max Bear too. Uh, Max Bear, very cocky, cocky and arrogant when he would go put on his stage persona. If he was doing an interview, he would always be trash talking, hyping it up, trying to you know sell more tickets and promote the fight. When he'd go in the ring, he would often clown around in the first couple rounds of the fight, and then he'd settle in and you know more often than not end up winning the winning the fight. Now going into the the Jim Braddock fight, just how it showed in the movie, Max Bear thought Braddock was a over the hill has been chump. He thought he was going to just mop the ring with them. That's why he didn't train a lot. That's why he was partying and drinking before that. And that's why he wasted the first few rounds of the fight and did a lot of clowning around and kind of dancing and trash talking, touching Jim on the head. Well, as the fight got close and it got into those later rounds, Jim won those early rounds because Max Bear was screwing around. Now, Max Bear ends up winning quite a few rounds too, but by the time he realized, oh crap, I'm not going to be able to knock Braddock out, uh, it was too late. And Jim had won too many rounds at that point. So who knows how it might have played out differently. I, I honestly think that if Max Bear had taken it very seriously and had trained for the fight, uh, he probably would have retained the heavyweight title. But who knows? They were just at different spots in their life. Uh, you know, he had never really faced the hardships that Braddock and his family had. He, at this point, he didn't have kids. He wasn't fighting for milk like Braddock was uh, and for his own family's survival, he was fairly well off. And, uh, you know, he was just fighting because he wanted to be the champ and make more money and, you know, be a, a celebrity. Uh, next up, Max Bear, like, so to sum up for it, I think he's cocky, but not a total jerk. I don't think Max Bear is a villain. Uh, I also would like to see a movie someday made just about Max Bear. Uh, I'm going to get into why that is on one of the next slides coming right up. But actually, a big chunk of this PowerPoint is de dedicated to Max Bear because I think he's a super interesting guy uh, and a really cool fighter, too. Now, the whole thing where he killed two guys in the movie, they stretch the truth a little bit on that. Uh, he actually, now let me show you the photos of these two guys, Frankie Campbell and Ernie Schaff. They talk about both of them in the movie. They drop their names. Um, all right, for the first one, Ernie Schaff. He uh, had been a pretty good boxer. Both of these guys were like ranked boxers. Uh, neither one of them really ever had a shot at being heavyweight champ. Frankie Campbell is actually really comparable record-wise and style to Jim Braddock. Ernie Schaff, I don't know quite as much about him. Uh, 
for the Ernie Schaff story, they fought each other. Okay. Bear and Schaff fought each other. Uh, Bear pretty decisively won the fight. He knocked Schaff down multiple times. He was known to be an exceptionally hard puncher. And he, I guess, drilled him and caught him and just like he beat him up pretty bad in the fight. Uh, After the fight, Ernie was having severe neck pains and headaches. He goes to his doctor. The doctor says, does an examination of him and is like, man, you've done, you've got severe trauma to your brain stem. Uh, and he said, you're done boxing. You can never box again. You would like literally be risking your own life if you uh, step into a ring again. And if you get punched just right, that, that could be the end of the road for you, buddy. Well, think though, that this is playing out during the Great Depression. A lot of these boxers were in a similar situation to Jim Braddock, where they're just, they're trying to survive and get some money. And this was their profession. That was what they had been doing and training for, uh, for years and years. Well, after a, like it was a couple month break, Ernie takes another fight against his doctor's wishes. Uh, I guess in that next fight, they were squaring off. They had traded a couple little punches back and forth. And then I'm not even sure who his opponent was, uh, but he catches Ernie with a jab to the chin and Ernie, boom, drops dead right on the spot. Now, anybody that was watching that fight and knew anything about boxing, they said immediately, that punch wouldn't kill anybody. It wasn't that punch. Like, it, And then when people started digging into it and thinking about it and knowing his story, then it was, it was pretty obvious that like it was the damage that he had sustained during the Max Bear fight that now this fight, a few months later, he hadn't fully healed. Uh, he gets punched just right, and then boom, it, it, it flared up that injury, that brainstem injury, and killed him right on the spot. Uh, so a sad end for Ernie, but uh, that one gets attributed to Max Bear. They kind of talked about that in the movie and actually spun that one pretty accurately. Now this one uh, gets eh, spun a little bit more, and I don't think is quite portrayed accurately in the movie. Uh, in the movie, it's like, Frankie, you watch that video where they're trying to talk Jim out of fighting Max Bear. And they're saying, like, it's as good as murder if you go fight this guy. Um, Frankie Campbell, who had a very similar style to Jim Braddock, uh, had had a fight. This is like a year or so before the the Bear Braddock fight. Um, Frankie's a little bit older, a little bit slower. Max Bear's an up-and-coming fighter. Uh, Behind-the-scenes info. Now, these guys actually did have legit beef going into the fight. Max Bear, I guess, had had a little dispute with his trainer, the guy that would be in his corner. And like the day before the fight, Max Bear's trainer goes over and joins Frankie Campbell's team. Okay, so you could see like if you're Max Bear, that's going to kind of piss you off right there that man, my trainer who I trusted knows my style just went over to my opponent. Um, These guys come out. and I don't think it was necessarily that Frankie Campbell and Max Bear hated each other, but there was a lot of drama and beef that was playing into this whole fight and the hype of it. Now, Bear is probably a better fighter. He's younger. He's more energetic. And he had trained hard for that one. So this fight starts off. And I guess right from the get go, Max Bear is like, uh, he's not happy and he's trash talking. And from Er Frankie Campbell's corner and Max Bear up in the ring, they're yelling and shouting things, swearing at each other. And the fight just kind of spirals out of control and it gets really tense. Well, once Max Bear gets pissed off enough, it's the clown goes away and the killer comes out. Uh, not that he intentionally tried to kill this guy, but he starts just throwing bombs on Frankie. Now, unfortunately, there was a really young ref that was running this fight. Okay. I, uh, <clears throat> Max Bear, at one point in the fight, he gets Frankie Campbell up into the corner of the ring, which that's always bugged me about boxing. They call it a ring, but it's actually a square. So he gets trapped up into the corner. Now, if you're a boxer, when do you stop throwing punches? Think about that a second. If you're a boxer, when would you, you're in a fight, when would you stop throwing? Two times. When you hear the ding, 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 that's the end of the round, you're supposed to stop. If you throw a punch after that, you'll get penalized points or potentially disqualified. The other time is if you feel hands come up on you, if you feel somebody touch you and pull you back, that's the ref, the only other person in there in the, in the ring with you. If the ref comes up, they're trained to stop throwing punches if the ref puts hands on him and pushes him back. Well, Frankie Campbell, I guess, got knocked out. He was in the corner and Max Bear is just raining blows on him. He's so mad about his manager thing. It's like he's teaching him a lesson and taking it all out on Frankie. 
Frankie was unconscious, but he was on the ropes and he was still propped up. Uh, Bear just continues to throw punches. Bear probably in the heat of the moment didn't totally totally realize that he was unconscious. Um, the new ref, who absolutely should have seen that and should have intervened, and, and they're trained to do that. Like if you see somebody you think they go out, you gotta you pull them apart and you check them out before you let the fight go on. That ref took too long and he let Bear throw an extra three, four, five punches while he was backed up there. Eventually, when the ref does pull him back. Frankie just drops onto the the canvas. Now in the movie, it was like he died right there on the spot and they show Max Bear like standing over him, puffing up his chest, like growling at him. In real life, didn't quite play out that way. Uh, He does drop, he's unconscious. He never regains consciousness, but he did not die in the ring. Frankie was then rushed to the hospital. I guess in the meantime, before the ambulance got there and picked him up, then Max Bear kind of came to his senses. The fight's done and he realizes, oh crap, this just got way more serious than I was intending it to. Max Bear actually took a knee right beside him. I guess he started to tear up and get emotional. He even called his new trainer, his like medic guy that would like patch up his wounds and stuff mid fight, call him over and they're administering aid to Frank and Camel, like both sides are and trying to like resuscitate him and get him conscious again. Uh, He goes to the hospital. The damage was just too severe. Like he he had also detached the brain stem. Um, it was major trauma. He never regains consciousness, and he dies several hours later in the hospital with his wife by his side. So Frankie Campbell and his wife are in there. Um, yeah, and that was the end of him. I guess at the hospital, Max Bear came up there and he profusely apologized to his wife. Was like, you know, I was mad about my whole trainer thing, but I didn't mean to, I didn't really want to hurt him. And I guess Max Bear was like hysterical in tears and crying. He also donated all of his winnings, his whole purse for thousands of dollars to the Campbell family. Um, and he felt really bad about it. Now they actually thought about press, they, they convened a grand jury and they were deciding whether they were going to press murder charges on Max Bear. But it didn't really go anywhere because think about it. If anybody should really kind of get in trouble for that, you can't blame the boxer for throwing really hard punches in a sport that's all about throwing punches. It really was the ref should have intervened and stopped that. And they're watching for that. In the heat of the moment, a boxer is going to keep throwing punches until they hear the ding, 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 or until a, a ref comes and grabs them. So he does get off the hook. Now, in the movie, they hype it up like, like Max Bear is proud of killing two people. Uh, now he really was promoted in the media as a guy that's killed two boxers. He's a killer because he kind of legitimately did. Uh, but I I do want to add in that like in real life, I think Max Bear took zero pride in that. Like he he may have played it up a little bit in the media because he knew it would sell more tickets. But I really do think that like in his personal life, from what I've read about him. He wasn't proud of that and he never wanted to kill anybody. He just wanted to be a good boxer and be the champ and make money and, you know, live that lifestyle. All right, moving on. So past the killer part. Now, here's where Max Bear's story, I think, gets super interesting. Um, They say that like like Jim Braddock was the heavyweight champ of the world or Max Bear was the heavyweight champ of the world before that. But in real life, are you the heavyweight champ of the world? No, he's like the heavyweight champ of North America, Uh, the United States. Then there are some boxers in Canada, some in Mexico, but that's where you're going to be fighting. You actually don't fight boxers from Asia or from Europe. Uh, So there are actually in boxing, often there are multiple world heavyweight champs. Uh, But there is a couple different like kind of pools of, uh, of talent and fighting out there. So Europe, Uh, has their own heavyweight champ too. And the heavyweight champ at the same time Max Bear was heavyweight champ was Max Schlemming. He is a German boxer. Actually, buddy, buddy with, guess who? Adolf Hitler. So think about it. This is all happening. Like in between the Corn Griffin fight where Braddock uh, started his comeback and one year later, uh, the Max Bear fight where Braddock wins. So that time of the movie, that year time where the comeback's happening, This all plays out, but they don't show any of it in the movie. Why not? Because you'd actually start to like Max Bear and you'd really start to appreciate his story. And it would be a total, it would totally sidetrack you from what was going on with the Braddock family. So purposely, the the director kind of kept all this silent and didn't cover it. But I find it fascinating. So while Braddock is making his comeback, Max Bear has a couple fights that year too. They hype this up that, hey, we're going to have an intercontinental bout. 
They, I don't know who got the ball rolling on it, but they decided we're going to have the European champ and the American champ, and we're going to have them fight each other, and then we'll have a true world heavyweight champ. Now, this is 19, late 34 uh, when this is happening. That's the year Hitler totally locks down power in Germany. He had been kind of rising uh, for about four to six years before that. But by 34, after that election cycle, Hitler's the man. He is the dictator that's running Nazi Germany. Okay, the Nazis are firmly established. You know, the Nazis have all kinds of propaganda and they talk about being the supermen and the Aryan race. Well, of course you would use what your pro athletes is shining examples of that. So Hitler took a lot of pride in the best fighter in Europe, the best fighter in the world is one of our German boxers. Uh, so Max Schlemming, even though I don't think he was like a hardcore Nazi or super like anti-Jewish, um, he was just in that place at that time. And he becomes buddy buddy with a lot of the Nazis and he's used in a lot of Nazi propaganda. And of course, like if the leader of the country likes you and is patting your back and giving you money and hooking you up, not many people would turn that down. Uh, and this is way before the Holocaust or any of that stuff had happened yet. Now, Max Baer, think about his last name, B-A-E-R. Where is that from? Actually, it's a German last name. Now, Max Baer was born in America, uh, but his parents were German immigrants. On top of that, they weren't just Germans. They were actually part of the small percentage of Jews that lived in Germany. So Max Baer was a, a Jewish German, like he was the child of immigrants that had left Europe and come over to America, but he's a Jew. Now think about that, how that's playing out, where Hitler's coming to power. He's talking about the master race. He's openly he's talks so much trash about the Jews. And now his prize German fighter is going up against some American Jew boxer. Uh, you could imagine like the, the propaganda and hype around it is like a fever pitch. Uh, and a lot of people in America, we know what the Nazis are kind of sort of up to, even though the war hasn't broke out yet. Most Americans are pretty anti-Nazi and they don't like Hitler. So you have everybody over here in America and a lot of places in Europe, uh, Great Britain and France, they're all rooting for Max Baer. You have Germany and the places that are kind of in their sphere of influence that are rooting for Max Schlemming. I guess this was an amazingly big fight. They actually... <clears throat> because so many people wanted to see it, they, uh, they they ended up having it in America. Not sure how that not got negotiated, but we had, I think, bigger stadiums at the time. So they actually run this fight at Yankee Stadium outside on a, a summer night. Uh, it was a sold out crowd, like 65,000 people there, plus probably literally millions of people listening to it on the radio. Uh, massive, massive fight worldwide attention, literally. These two champs, they're going to decide who is the true heavyweight champ of the world. Well, Max Bear, like I told you, he kind of slacked off for the Braddock fight and thought Braddock was a chump. Well, he knows Hitler hates Jews. Uh, he, for the first time ever, wears a Jewish star of David on his trunk. Uh, trunks. Now, actually in Cinderella Man, He's wearing that, but they they make it black instead of shining white uh, because it, that way it doesn't stand out as much. Because think about it. If you were watching that and you saw that in the closing scene of Cinderella Man where he's wearing that star in his trunks, you'd be like, why the heck has he got that? What's the story there? Like, You know what I mean? And they didn't want to distract from the Braddock story. But even when he fought Braddock, he, he had that big star of David on his trunks. Uh, he started it for the first time ever. He put that on his boxing trunks in this fight because he wanted to send the message to Hitler that your prize guy is fighting a Jew over here. I am a proud Jew. I hate you. You know what I mean? Kind of giving him a big middle finger. Uh, now, Max Bear slacked off for the Braddock fight. He did not slack off in training for the Max Schlemming fight. He trained like a madman. He realized that like... The whole world's watching this fight, for one. He also realized that, like, Jews in America, that, you know, and Jews in Europe that are getting bullied by the Nazis, that, uh, hey, I'm standing up. I'm representing that community. Uh, they take pride in me. I've got a lot of people rooting for me and counting on me, and they want me to, like, send a message kind of to Hitler. Well, the fight goes on. I guess Max Baer smokes Max Schlemming. He beats the heck out of him. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the end result was, like if it was a decision or a knockout, but I know Max Baer did decisively win that fight. Hitler is furious about it. I mean, think about that. Your top boxer, the guy that's your champ, just got beat by an American Jew. 
Ooh, Hitler was so mad about it, I guess. And from that time on, he started shunning Max Schlemming. He like cut him out of the loop. He wouldn't let it be covered in German newspapers and on German radio. He like silenced it all. Uh, and Max Schlemming basically got sent over to sit in the corner. He's like, screw this guy. You really let me down. Uh, now more on him in just a second. But anyway, from that time on, Max Baer becomes a true hero in the American Jewish community. Uh, so I think that's a really awesome thing about him. I hope someday they make a story about Max Baer and uh, kind of give you that whole story too, uh, where I don't think he'd be the villain. He'd definitely be the protagonist. But of course, it makes the movie Cinderella Man so much better when you have a bad guy that you just love to hate and is cocky and arrogant and has killed two guys. Uh, and that just hypes the movie up more and gets you into it. Uh, but sometimes I think the true story is much more complex and nuanced. And I thought that was pretty interesting. I should share it with you. Um, oh, back up. So after he wins that, then it's about six months later, he loses the title to Jim Braddock. Max Bear never regains the title. Uh, he does box for several years after that. He ends up acting in some movies. His son is named Buddy Bear. Uh, Buddy Bear, if you've ever seen, um, oh, what is it? The Beverly Hillbillies, okay? Old 60s like TV show where it's the Clampets, they're the Hillbillies that move out to California and they're super rich. They strike oil money. Um, but or Jethro, who is like the hillbilly like nephew in that show, is actually named Buddy Bear in real life, and it was Max Bear's son. Hmm, how about that? And Max Bear actually appeared in a few movies and stuff. Uh, he retires. He actually kind of dies at a younger age. Has a heart attack at a casino after playing a bunch of cards. But he really did live that kind of jet setter, highfalutin lifestyle. Was a party man. Would love to be the center of attention. That's kind of who Max Bear was. Now, last little bit that I'm leaving you with, Joe Lewis. So the guy that, <clears throat> I think it's about a year and a half after the Max Bear jim Braddock fight, the last scene of the movie, Braddock doesn't take many more fights. He realizes he's getting old. He's like pushing 40 at this point. Uh, he knows, I mean, not dogging himself or that he didn't have faith in himself, but he knows he doesn't have many more fights left in him. And it's highly likely that whoever he fights next He's going to lose the title and he's going to be back into retirement. And that's the end of his boxing career. So he wants to make it count. Now, kudos to him. There were a lot of good boxers out there. Joe Lewis was for sure. If you followed boxing at the time, he was the best contender. He truly was the number one contender uh, and probably had been for a while. Now, a lot of other, uh, because of the racism at the time and the, the kind of the Jim Crow laws and all that stuff going on in the discrimination, Braddock could have picked to fight somebody else. He didn't ironclad have to fight Joe Lewis. Uh, a lot of other people probably would have said, I'm not going to take the fight with Joe Lewis because for one, he's really good. For two, I don't want to lose the title to a black guy for racial reasons. Uh, kudos to Jim Braddock because I don't think he was a super racist guy. I think he was probably a pretty decent guy. And he thought, yeah, Joe Lewis is probably the best boxer out there. I'm probably going to lose the title to somebody. Why not be a real good dude? Now, this is the thing that because Joe Lewis was so like, he was in such a position because he is a black guy trying to get the heavyweight title. He had watched in his childhood what happened to Jack Johnson and all the troubles he had went through. Uh, Joe Lewis is not a big trash talker. He doesn't want to pull a lot of attention to himself. Uh, and in order to lock in 100% that he's going to get that fight, he actually agrees. Check this little uh, tidbit out. This would be a good thing for you to put in your extra credit email. Uh, Joe Gould, who is Jim's manager, says, all right, Joe Lewis, we're debating whether we're going to fight you or a few other people. We'll make it you for sure. And honestly, we're probably going to lose to you because you're really, really good. Uh, but he said, if we give, the, give you this opportunity to be the heavyweight champ, you have to agree that for the next 10 years, one decade, you'll give 10% of your purses to Jim and I. All right. Kind of a weird clause, but there's no rule against doing something like that. Joe Lewis wants the title so bad. He says, I'll do it. Uh, now, at the time, Joe Lewis was a good up and coming boxer. The, everybody knew, you know, he, he was tough. Nobody realized at that time, though, that he was probably going to go down in history as the best heavyweight boxer in all world history, no matter what continent you're on. Uh, he is a phenomenal boxer. Uh, he's a real hero to the black community. He's a hero to Detroit. He's, they have the big fist down in Detroit City that's supposed to be Joe Lewis's fist, that big statue. It's like he's the brown bomber right out of the Motor City, okay? <clears throat> so 
I already went over this a little bit, but like he Braddock knocks him down. First time in his career that Joe Lewis got knocked to the canvas. Joe Lewis goes on to pretty easily win the fight, but they have a mutual respect. Even after that fight, Jim Braddock does retire as a boxer that never once got knocked out. So take some pride in that because Joe Lewis knocked out a lot of guys. Um, then he goes on to hold the heavyweight title for the next 13 years, which is like unprecedented. Nobody before or since has held the title that long. Phenomenal length of time, and he's a phenomenally good boxer. So like Braddock and Lewis, when they negotiated that 10% clause into the contract, they were thinking, yeah, Lewis will probably be the heavyweight champ for a year or two, maybe three. You know, he'll hold it for a while. We'll make some money off that. They, in their wildest dreams, didn't think for the next 10 years, he's going to be heavyweight champ that whole time, plus another three. So like, think Joe Lewis's purses keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So they actually made more money off the 10% Joe Lewis clause because his he's gets his purses up so high, then they actually made through Jim Braddock's whole comeback in that last year of his boxing career. So that combined with the, the winnings from the bear fight, they base that basically locks in that Jim Braddock's going to live pretty comfortably the rest of his life. Uh, final thing, my last tidbit for you. <clears throat> so after Joe Lewis wins the heavyweight title, now we're in about almost 1938, about a year before World War II starts. Max Schlemming, the German boxer, go back there. Uh, he's this guy right here. Bears next to him, the, the one that won with his hand up. Okay. Max Schlemming, that German boxer, it, it stays the heavyweight champ in Europe because, because he lost to an American boxer. It didn't take the European title away from him. Now, he's won several more fights. He's retained his title for a couple years. They end up deciding, let's have another intercontinental bout. Let's do this one more time. Um this time now, Joe Lewis is the heavyweight champ. Now, think about this one. So Schlemming lost to a, a Jewish guy the last time, which Hitler was none too happy about. But what does Hitler think about black people, Africans, African-Americans in this case? Uh, he doesn't hold a very high opinion of them either. He thinks that they're like subhuman and that the Germans are the top of the pyramid and all this. So you can imagine Max Schlemming has a lot of pressure on him to go beat this black American guy. Uh, the fight, again, is at Yankee Stadium. Sold out crowd attracts worldwide attention. Uh, Max Schlemming trained his butt off for this fight. Now, Joe Lewis kind of pulls a Max Bear type thing where he had defended his title a couple times. He felt very confident. He knew he was really good. He's the heavyweight champ in America for a few years. Everything's going good. Before this fight, he way underestimated Max Schlemming. Um, he was out golfing. He was he wasn't a partier like Jack Johnson, but he was partying a little bit, hanging out with his, hanging out with the girls, hanging out with his buddies. Um, and he doesn't train hard. And Max Schlemming ends up beating him. And this is like, oh, he. I guess Joe Lewis feels horrible after this fight because he feels like he let every black person in America down. He feels like he let down all of the United States too because he lost this Nazi scumbag who they're dogging on him and the propaganda and all that. Max Schlemming becomes Hitler's favorite little buddy again. Now he just beat this American champ. Hitler didn't expect him to win that fight, and he does. So now it's like Max Schlemming, oh, he's loved by the Nazi party again, back in propaganda. Um, but of course, what's boxing mostly about? It's not about punches. It's not about titles. It's about making money. And because that was such a hyped up fight that did attract world attention, they of course line up a rematch, which happens all the time in boxing and UFC and stuff. In the second fight, it also takes place at Yankee Stadium in front of a sold out crowd. Both sides are hyping it up and got all kinds of propaganda going. This is literally now several months before World War II starts. We're like right at knocking on the door of World War II. Uh, if it had been a little bit past that, the, the war would have started and it would have been possible to do the fight. This time, Joe Lewis trains like a madman. Uh, the president at the time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, actually goes and meets him and says, hey, look, son, the whole country is counting on you. We really want you to pull off this one and, you know, gives him a pep talk. Well, Joe Lewis trains like insanely hard. And I guess the fight starts up in like, it was like three or four times in the first round, Joe Lewis knocks Max Schlemming down to the canvas. He's just punishing him and he won't let up and he just buries him. Um, after a couple minutes of that, the ref finally calls the fight and it's a technical knockout because he knocked Max Schlemming just kind of stupid. So 
he ends up, he never really lost his title, but he was kind of undisputedly the best boxer in the, in the world at that point. And Joe Lewis, I believe I'd have to double check this, but in that 13 year period that he was the heavyweight champ, I think the only fight he lost at all was the Max Schlemming in that intercontinental bout. So he holds on to it for a long time. Uh, all right. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Remember, if you're doing the extra credit, reference that first post, but I'm looking for a couple really good little, uh, little facts for you to get me. All right. See ya.